Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 355th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Brad Ahrens. Brad is the co-founder and CEO of IntelliSense, an independent RIA with 12 offices across the country headquartered in Albert Lee, Minnesota, that oversees $6 billion in assets under management for more than 3,000 client households. What's unique about Brad, though, is how he built a multi-billion dollar advisory firm, not by moving up market to gather multimillionaire clients, but instead leverage his 401k retirement plan advisory firm to begin offering comprehensive financial planning to the employees of large companies as an added employee benefit, and in the process scaled his financial planning business around the mass affluent American worker. In this episode, we talk in depth about how, after realizing that his 401k plan participants were not being advised after they retired and were being poached by brokers and agents trying to sell them high commission annuities, Brad decided to expand his business into wealth management so that he could offer advice to his massive fluent clientele in their retirement years. However, Brad struggled to transition his retirement plan advisors into wealth management because of the different mindset it takes to service an ongoing financial planning relationship, but was able to acquire the advisors he needed by finding a firm that had already established the business model working with the clients Brad wanted to serve. And how Brad ultimately evolved a multi-pronged model of retirement plan advice, group insurance benefits, and personal financial planning to reach the $3,500 of revenue per client that he needed to be able to really scale the business. We also talk about how the approval of the Pension Protection Act and the backlash against revenue sharing agreements amongst retirement plan record keepers led Brad to decide that a flat fee would be the best way to start their initial advice offering. Why to avoid the fee compression as a 401k record keeper and the reinvestments into expensive tech it takes to keep scaling, Brad decided to sell his record keeping offering that at the time was 80% of their business to create more bandwidth to offer personal wealth management for their clients instead and use the profits of the sale to help fund the new initiative. And how Brad leveraged the data he already had access to from providing 401k advisement for companies to create personalized one-page financial plans for the plan participants to illustrate the value of financial planning and connect them more directly with the firm's advisors. And be certain to listen to the end where Brad shares how, even though he experienced multiple false starts with the business transition with several failed hires, he stayed committed and ultimately found it was better to acquire a firm to get the count he was seeking than to just try to hire it directly. How Brad now wishes that he got into wealth management sooner and believes that younger, newer advisors would benefit from acquiring their CFP designation as it can help them broaden their career opportunities in wealth management. And why Brad feels that even though he has built a sustainable firm with great talent that can live beyond his leadership, he has no intention of selling the business and plans to continue his journey of expanding the firm to provide more affordable financial planning for more of the mass affluent American workers. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Brad Ahrens. Welcome, Brad Ahrens, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, flattered to be here. I'm, I'm excited about today's conversation and, and getting to talk about this, what to me is an, an, an interesting ongoing convergence of what historically were, were some very separate channels of what kind of the, the wealth management end of the business did for individual consumers and what the, the retirement plan business has done in the world of like small and large businesses on the 401k side. You know, I feel like for a lot of the past 20 or 30 years, like these were really separate channels. One of the big focal points for folks in the wealth business was like we would work with retirees and pre-retirees because nobody could manage the money or do any or give any advice as long as the money was held in a 401k plan and retirement was like this grand transition rollover event where all of a sudden like the money was liquid for the first time and an advisor could manage it and work with that household and and that became a place where so many of us focused and now we seem to be transforming into this world where more and more retirement plan advisors saying wait a minute like we we've already got the 401k plan. We already have a relationship with the plan participants. Like maybe we should be doing more of this wealth management stuff to them directly. And, and I know that you've, you've lived a lot of this journey coming from the retirement plan advisor side with many, many decades in the business. 
uh, in the retirement plan world and morphing into the wealth management side. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk about what that evolution looks like. And I guess just understanding because so many of us who listen to this podcast have, have spent our careers on the wealth management side, like how what it's like on the retirement plan advisor side and how different it is or maybe not to come from retirement plan business into the wealth management business. Uh, there's no doubt that convergence is um, is happening, uh, really, between retirement, wealth, and health. Um, this is not something that um, came into being over the last year or two. It's, it's really at least five or six years old, um, and uh, it's in full force right now. It is, for a number of reasons. I, I would say... Uh, first of all, um, the economics. Um, as a retirement plan advisor, we do have intimate um, conversations with participants in, in retirement plans. And um, yet we've consistently walked away from that in the past. Um, and um, uh, on the other side of, of our economic side is uh, there's been dramatic fee compression in the retirement plan space, not just with record keepers, but also for advisors. I mean, dramatic uh, fee compression. And so it was looked at as a way to um, replace some of that lost income um, that all of us have seen. So help me understand a little bit more on that end, just you know, in the in the wealth side of the world, the industry has been talking about fee compression for uh, certainly ten plus years because we're now more than a decade out from the uh, you know the infamous launch of like the betterments at wealth fronts of the world that were supposed to you know obliterate advisor fees uh, uh, down to twenty five basis points. Uh, you know, even before that, just sort of like the rise of computers and internet, there's been a discussion out there for a while of like if fee compression is inevitably coming for the wealth managers. Yet in practice, like it's basically been non-existent for 20 years. Like some advisors charge outrageous fees and they have struggled. But if you look at industry benchmarking studies on the wealth side, like the median advisory fee was 1% last year and 1% five years ago and 1% 10 years ago and 1% 20 years ago. Like it it has not moved at the median level. What like how has that been different in the retirement plan advisor side? It's like we talk about fee compression for wealth, but it isn't really happening. What did fee compression look like in the retirement plan world as it seems to have really played out there? Well, ironically, it started on the record keeping side. And um, on the record keeping side, there was um, what we called revenue sharing, which was fee sharing from mutual funds um, used to fund a 401k plan. And uh, the awareness that that was happening um, really caused uh, us as advisors to look at that because that money <laughs> was um, extra money to the record keepers. And um, we as an industry felt compelled that we needed to go and get that money on behalf of our clients. And, and we did that. And as a result, we, the retirement plan advisor, reduced record keep keeping plans significantly. And um, and our clients were were really really happy about it, but um, then they said, "Okay, um, what about your fees?" <laughs> <laughs> well, while we're on yeah. the subject of compressing fees, <laughs> dot dot yeah. dot. <laughs> yeah, that 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 is what happened. You know, we ended up taking taking um, taking all these plans out for bid. Um, from a record keeping standpoint, and uh, I mean the significant fee reductions. I mean by significant, I'm talking over fifty percent, and sometimes it was like a sixty to seventy percent reduction. So what? Um, what were those? I mean, like from what to what? Like that's like because the retirement plan used to get one percent, and now it got like fifty or forty basis points. Like, is that the scale or? The numbers all different in the first place. Well, the record keepers generally, uh, you had two camps. You had you had the record keepers that would would charge a um, per head fee, 
Okay. Uh, and then you had uh, record keepers that would convert that into a basis point fee. Okay. And then you had record keepers, which was probably the vast majority, um, do a little bit of both, kind of a mixture. Okay. And then they had, um, and th those were the fees that they put in their contracts. And uh, it mentioned nothing about this revenue sharing that was coming in from uh, from the mutual funds. And that was going to be anywhere from 25 to 35 basis points. Significant. And they kept that money. The record keepers did. So... So what ultimately drove the shift? Because I'm trying to remember, like, I think it was 2010 that Department of Labor started doing some of their new, like, retirement plan fee disclosure rules. Like, was was that the the catalyst that started putting the focus on this? Or did the, the market kind of get there independently on its own? Well, um, that was um, – that wasn't the beginning, but it, it – uh, exacerbated. I, I mean, it just stretched it, and and it just went everywhere. Uh, I mean, the 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 very um, the best advisors learned about this, and we started being advocates uh, for our clients that really that was coming out of plan assets, and that really that should be put back in the plan. So that and, was that was the whole domain when. Uh, like the 408B2 disclosure right. started coming out. And so you're being the drum, like we got to get the disclosure documents and then we're going to pour over them and scrutinize them. And like, we're going to, we're going to find the dollars for you to save you, Mr. and Mrs. Plan fiduciary uh, on all these costs like that, that, Ex that became the focal point. Exactly. And the pension protection act um, just made it real. It okay. forced it, you know, where where we were going out and from a competitive standpoint, we would go in and we would tell a prospect, um, we'd ask the prospect whether or not they knew about this revenue. And uniformly, they would say, they would say no. And we would say, well, let us do a study. And um, we would show them how much money um, was coming in. <laughs> and without question, um the plan sponsor wasn't happy about it, and secondly, would then hire us uh, to to do it for them. And um, the Pension Protection Act just made it a legal requirement. Uh, I'm, so I'm struck by that. That right, sort of the interesting effect. Re retirement plans have their own dynamics around uh, uh, how fiduciary duty laces in and the impact of ERISA fiduciary. That like the 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 regulators didn't actually have to come in and say, like, we're banning all these rev share agreements. They just made everybody disclose them. And then all the fiduciaries came in and fee compressioned it out of existence all by themselves anyways. Like, maybe that's oversimplifying, but I, I feel like that's the – seems to be how it played out. Like, because the – because there was a fiduciary overlay to this, all – I'm putting like air quotes – all the regulators had to do – was start creating some of these mandatory disclosures and force the information out there. And then uh, the marketplace started doing its thing. And what the Pension Protection Act did is it really forced the advisor um, to ask these same questions of plan advisors. And, okay. and, and we ended up having to benchmark our fees. And as a result, um, Fees have come down in, in an enormous way for uh, retirement plan advisors. So, so it started that record keeper business got squeezed. Then it rippled down to the the retirement advi retirement plan advisors advising on the plans as well. So, I think you said the the record keeper saw as much as like fifty percent price cutting. How much? How much did it show up as a an advisor working with retirement plans? Like how did how did that fee compression play out for you? It did a couple of things. Number one, it uh, forced us to move to a flat fee in many instances where the industry was uniformly uh, pricing and basis points. 
Um, it forced us also to look at the services that we were delivering for that day um, because it w- could vary depending upon the advisor and depending upon the services that the plan sponsor wanted. So, for example, uh, it was not unusual for a $50 million plan um, that just had an advisor really handle the fiduciary side of the plan, which would be four meetings per year, four meetings with an investment committee. And it was not unusual for that fee to be six figures. Okay. Today, today, if you're only working at the, um, at the plan level, that's probably a $40,000 flat fee. Okay. And maybe less. There, there may be advisors that come in less. So a similar kind of 50 plus percent price compression, at, at least at the high end, because at some point someone's just coming in and saying, yeah, I appreciate all the work you're doing and we have a lot of dollars at stake, but like, come on, you're meeting with us four times a year. Like I can only, nope. <laughs> I can only pay you so much in like an hourly rate or an hourly equivalent, even if we're going to get the in-between meeting work and all the rest, like this is just adding up to too much. So, so does that mean most of the fee compression came at the at like at the high end, at the larger end, it was the like it was the it was the large plans that said like I appreciate you don't charge a whole lot of basis points, but our plan is so large that it's still adding up for a whole lot of money for only four meetings a year. Y'all y'all need to change this. Like, was it is that where the pressure compression was showing up the most? Is the high end of the market or up and down and everywhere in between? It was everywhere, <laughs> literally. Um, it didn't matter the size of the plan. <laughs> Um, it was it was everywhere. Now, um, if you were an advisor like IntelliSense, we have some clients uh, where we only work at the plan level, but we the majority of our clients hire us for participant services. Uh, we don't, or the plan sponsor doesn't use the services services of uh, the record keeper. We go in and we do all the employee education and advice, actually. Uh, there. And that will allow us to keep our fees, uh, not at where they were, but th- that will add significant time um, that we have to spend there. And uh, generally, uh, we can recapture that that fee compression if if we uh, do the participant with, services. With, with, the, with the caveat, like we can we can recapture the fee compression by like doing a whole bunch of additional work. Like you, you you know, you're not, you don't get to recapture it for free. You get to like, okay, if we go do more things for the plans, at least we can earn our way back to the fee that we had before. Uh, But we have to do all this additional stuff to justify it now. Um, Now in, in practice, IntelliSense was doing it before. I mean, we'd always taken the approach that we would be the ones that were the best at at employee education and advice. So we had consistently um, uh, done that. But that, you know, um, I would say that our legacy plans, we, we didn't um, we didn't have uh, as much fee compression as our new plans. When we were going out to bid, uh, it was just a new game. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, who's it's, it felt like a race to the bottom. It really did. And um, it, it, it resulted in fee compression also on the employee education and advice uh, space. So, so help us understand a, a little bit more in that direction, at least for where the business was historically. And then we'll come to, I know what has been a lot of transformation for the, for your firm and the industry overall for the, the, the past five to seven years. But if we're going back to, you know, early 2010s and and prior, you had said like you know, you're in so many of these conversations with pr- retirement plan participants in the first place. I think you'd said like we we have a lot of these intimate conversations with participants already, but you'd you'd consistently walked away from that business in the past, or just like the retirement plan industry overall had walked away from that industry in the past. So help us understand more. You know, for all of us in the wealth end, like it's just 
that's what we're trying to do is get in front of people <laughs> having to make conversations about money and and charge fees for advice. So like what was it about the retirement plan business and space that that made people walk away from that business even as they were having some of these conversations? Like what was that historical blocking point? I, I, I would say that we were nervous. We were nervous that it could be deemed a prohibited transaction by the Department of Labor. Okay. Um, even though it was uncertain, there was all this talk about if you're going to be a retirement uh, plan advisor, uh, it would be a conflict of interest if you're also going out and selling additional things. And, okay. And um, – we were we were nervous about it. I'm not saying that there weren't people that were doing it. There were, but uh, many of us um, felt that uh, we just needed to kind of sit on the sidelines on that issue until we actually got the word from the Department of Labor that we could actually be on involved in both of those transactions. So when you're already trying to thread the thread the needle of not trigger fiduciary issues when you're a big firm selling proprietary plans with proprietary products inside of your retirement plan like maybe you figured out how to ma- how to manage that balance in a standalone 401k world but the moment you then go in and say oh let's also do wealth advice and we'll cross sell more of our company's proprietary funds to these plan participants you're just opening up layer upon layer of fiduciary liability that they did not want when they were coming to it from a a less fiduciary, more proprietary world in the first place? Well, it was an advantage for us. I I mean, where where the wirehouses and broker independent broker dealers were just um, beside themselves and and went to Washington to try to get this changed, um, you know, we'd always live by those fiduciary standards. And so for us, our biggest headache was developing the technology so that we can prove that everything was in um, the participants' best interest. If we were rolling them out of the plan, um, how are you going to prove that it was truly in that participant's best interest? And we just, we had to develop those systems from a tech standpoint and then compliance standpoint to make sure that um, we didn't have issues there and we could prove it. So for those who aren't familiar with just how, how those, how that kind of, I guess, like documentation compliance works, like what... What did you have to do? I mean, how do you prove <laughs> that it was in the client's best interests? Um, well, we built ours in Salesforce. We did it internally. We were just fortunate to to come across employees that had a lot of experience with Salesforce, which was our CRM. And um, if one of our advisors uh, works with a participant in one of our retirement plan clients uh, is, is working with them and makes a recommendation to pull the money out of the plan and into an IRA. Um, that system that we built within Salesforce uh, requires them before they can get paid or actually do the transaction to provide the proof that um, this was truly in the advisors or in the uh, participants' best interest. And that included going out and comparing costs of the IRA versus uh, leaving the money in the plan. Um, It's mostly that, quite frankly. So now catch us up in the context of your business. So you'd been, I guess, in the retirement plan advisor world for a long time. You're watching these fee compression forces swirl around where you know fee rates are getting chopped by i guess sounds like as as much as 50% on on opportunities in a relatively limited number of years so i was i was going to ask what did you do but i guess first just take us back like what what did the retirement plan business look like like what was your business at that point as you're staring this down and figuring out like what's the what's the future of our company in this environment um, aside from, from fee compression, um, we were extremely concerned about um, what was happening to the average 401k participant when they left the plan. 
Um, I'll tell you a story. Um, my largest client. Um, we obtained that client in 1986. We actually put their 401k in. And we did all the employee education, which was not just mandatory group meetings, but one-on-ones. We gave advice. And, oh, this was probably a... Um, so this was probably 10 years ago. I went to, uh, to one of the quarterly meetings and the CFO of uh, the client, who was a heavy manufacturer, I mean, very, very blue collar. Um, he started the meeting out. He was chair of the uh, plan investment committee. And he said, Brad, you've done a fantastic job getting our employees to retirement. And and I'm just beaming ear to ear. And then he goes, but then, then you abandon them. And somebody from some broker uh, comes in with a beautiful brochure on this index annuity that has um, 350 basis points of internal expense and probably uh-huh. 10 years of surrender charge. And he said in one transaction, he destroys 25 years of your work. And uh, it was true. It was happening all the time. Um, in fact, that client in one quarter had $15 million leave the plan as in-service distributions. And it, it went 100% into an index annuity Wow! that, pl- that paid a 7% commission. So you're you're watching commission based insurance agents basically rate raid oh. the raid the plan assets and not even waiting for retirement, like getting people with in service distributions. Yep, exactly. And you know, these are these are not people that have their own outside fee based advisor. They're not. Uh, this is the American worker. It's the ninety nine percent instead of the one percent. And we just became extremely concerned that this was happening. And so when we looked at it, we said, you know, we didn't feel that the private wealth business was going to come down and work with those people because a lot of the uh, private wealth advisors would have minimums that were seven figures. Um, And here you had distributions of $150,000. And uh, who was going to work for them? Um, and was it going to be um, was it going to be the fee based advisors that live by the fiduciary standard? Uh, we just didn't see that happening. It wasn't going to be the uh, employee benefit advisor. Um, they they had no desire to do it. And the commission guys were the people that we were worried about. And, and that's where that's where we saw all the uh, pillaging going on. And so we sat back and said, this system is broken for the American worker. I think we can fix it. We have the investment knowledge to be able to do it. Now we just need to get into the private wealth space. And um, that's what we did. So this is... 10 years ago, like just roughly where, when or where are we in the, in the, the evolution of like all the fee compression forces that were starting to roll through the, the retirement plan business? We made the decision in 2015. Okay. Uh, the decision was number one, we're going to sell, we were a, an independent record keeper at the time. We were a big one. I mean, we had 120 people that worked in that division. And um, we had made the decision to sell that side of our business. And that gave us the bandwidth to focus on getting into private wealth because so, we were not in that business. So help help me understand, I, I guess, the sizing overall for advisors who aren't familiar, like what how how big was the record keeping business? I don't know how you if you measure that by revenue or plan assets or number of plans. Like what did what did that business look like? Uh, well, we had 120 employees. Um, did all of those uh, just do a retirement plan record keeping? No, we also um, uh, processed uh, Section 125 flex plans. Okay, which kind of went hand in glove with 401k. And um, we also had our own HSA, 
that um, we were doing the record keeping and we also did the advisory work on that. And then we were processing payroll for our clients. So we were very complicated, extremely complicated. There were very many independent record keepers like us. We had clients in 48 states. Approximately 80% of our revenue was coming from um, the advisory side on the retirement um, business, where we were the fiduciary advisor for the mostly 401k plans. And then about 20% of our business, we had a separate, we have a separate division that does group insurance. So wait, so, so 80% of your revenue came from the advisory retirement plan advisory side. Like that's, that's the revenue that was overlaid on the bookkeeper. I mean, like that's, that was the bookkeeper side of the business that essentially was 80% of the overall business. No, the, the, the record keeping side was, um, in the, in the beginning when we got into that business, it was a stepsister business. It really was. And, um, we basically only record kept the plans that we sold. Um, but then, uh, in the mid nineties, I made the decision that we were, we were either going to sell that business then, or we were going to have to, um, expand our marketing. And we made our uh, record keeping services available to outside advisors. And we had some huge advisors um, that used us to do record keeping uh, for them. Um, so that business grew to be about three times the size of our advisory business. Okay. And then we sold that business effective December 31st of 2015. That left a business that about 80% of the advisory business was retirement and about 20% of the advisory business was on the uh, uh, group health, group benefits. Okay. We called it. So, so I guess I'm just trying to understand. So be, before the sale – of the record keeping business, like that was the main channel of the business. I mean, it sounds like this was like 75% record keeping, 25% was all the advisory and group insurance combined. Yes. Then you like you sold off 75% of the business and kept the other 25% core, which was mostly advisory at that point. Am I understanding that right? Correct. And we had about 20 employees. All right. So just <laughs> so awkward. So you went from a business that was like 140 team members down the 20. Yes. All right. So walk me through that a little more. Like how, how do you get to a decision to say like, yeah, I picked the future. Let's sell 80, 75, 80% of our business off. Well, uh, <laughs> we, we structured the businesses as separate companies. Um, a lot of independent record keepers didn't do it that way, but I made the decision early on that these were going to be two separate and distinct businesses. And um, we even had um, – uh, diverse ownership of those two, two businesses. Um, and I, I did that because I didn't know what was going to happen long term. And I thought that by doing that, that would give us options when it was time to make a decision such as selling uh, part of the business. Um, why did we sell that side of the business? Uh, we had outgrown our technology. I mean, we were using basically a desktop uh, technology, and we had grown to the point where we needed uh, a lot more horsepower. And that technology was going to cost us millions of dollars. Um, it, would, it, it was going to cost us million, millions of dollars, not only just for the software, but then we would have to spend another couple million just getting it programmed. I mean, we knew what system we wanted to, to go with, but um, mm. the thought of, of spending that kind of money on that, um, when just, it just was not, it, it wasn't palpable. I, in, the, in the face of de- d- immense fee compression at the same time. So like, just to be clear, like we may have to spend millions of dollars to modernize our tech while we get hammered on fees every single year. Yeah, we were making money. We were. I mean, you don't make a ton of money in in record keeping, but you, we were making money. So what is, what does was, that mean in like in a in a margins context? Like, what is what's the margins of a record keeping business? Oh, like, is that a, I, I I would say twenty percent tops. Okay, and you have to have um, uh, you you have to have 
a, a big stable of clients um, in order to generate uh, a twenty percent EBITDA. Okay, so otherwise, like you're you're living you're living you're living with EBITDA in the teens, and then facing all this pressure to make these like immense reinvestments into the business. Exactly, and then then all of a sudden we got an offer. We really, it was an inquiry. It was an inquiry from our biggest competitor in the upper Midwest, and that was a large bank. And um, I knew that the person that ran their retirement uh, division, and he had he just called me up and said, "Brad, um, you've got a great business. Um, please consider us if if um, if you ever want to sell it." It was very, very low, low pressure. And um, we had three owners of, of that side of our business. And we sat down and uh, decided it wouldn't hurt uh, to see what we're worth, <laughs> what they uh-huh. would pay us. And, and frankly, that, that price came back a lot higher than I ever thought um, we would ever get. You know, every year I do my own personal um, – financial statement and it was like double what i had carried that uh, as, you know the, wow as an asset on and so you know we just sat there and said holy cow um in the midst of all this stuff that's going on somebody's willing to pay us that much money for this business so and so, so does that I, make you like like are you like what do they see about my business that i don't see like what am i what am i missing here well, you, you know, um, to some extent, yes, and and that is that um, there is a no no one in the retirement business has really ever sat down and said, okay, what is the economic value of a participant? Mm-hmm. Um, but you can bet Fidelity's done that. Yep. You can bet Empower's done that. You can bet that Schwab has done that in principle, but nobody, I, I, you know, I was, I was very, um, experienced in, in, um, in that side of the business. And I can tell you when we had our conferences, when we had our, our, um, think tanks, uh, we never talked about the value of a participant. That is not the case. today. And so, uh, I will tell you in 2000. 15, when we sold, we weren't thinking of it in, in that way. We okay. were not thinking of it but, in that way. But your buyer was, and that's where the offer presumably I came that. from? I okay. suspect that, yeah. I suspect that. How do you break the news internally? Like, hey, I just want to let you all know, like, 80% of you are going to be leaving shortly. But the other 20%, like, we're totally building for the future. Well, the good thing about it is um, one of the reasons that we were comfortable with this is there was they were going to keep everybody and they were going to keep the office in the same place. Mm. Um, and so it wasn't going to be something where they were going to take all this business and move it to their location and process it with their people. They wanted us because they had sites on expanding out of their current footprint, and they couldn't just do it um, uh, out of their location. And in fact, they wanted some somebody that had a strong presence uh, and was economically sound in small town USA because we could do it cheaper. Interesting. So, uh, so relative to, I just think it was like the, the, the traditional view of the news comes that a big firm's acquiring your company and everybody's sitting around waiting to find out who and how many people are getting laid off from all the proverbial cost synergies like that. That wasn't the tone and context of the deal here. This was someone who was actually really excited to have your people in your offices and your locations and invest into them uh, because it was a growth opportunity for the buyer. Correct. The only person who got let go was the CFO, but I hired him to stay with with our business, the advisory side. So everybody came out square there. Um, And even though... It was a shock. Um, we had in mind when we were considering this transaction the best interest of our employees, and uh, the buyer lived up to that. So you get to the other side of this deal, 
you've suddenly gone from 140 team members to 20 with what now it sounds like is a, a pretty focused business into working with these plans, doing just the advisory side, the, like the investment consulting side, and supporting them on some group group insurance as well. So, so I guess just talk to us about like setting the business vision, resetting the business vision. Right now, I'm struck like now all of a sudden you have you know fewer people than you've had in 20 years and more money in the bank account than you've had ever <laughs> and like a fresh opportunity to decide what to do next. Um, we put that business plan together. Uh, ironically, we had never had a business plan. Yet we grew to, you know, this this company with 140 some employees. Uh, we just worked hard, came up with a few good ideas, and weren't afraid to um, be a pioneer. Um, we were not afraid to uh, adopt things before other people did, like getting into 401k things like that. Um, putting our own HSA together, we we. Um, we did a lot of that um, there. Um, I, I think that that's always been a, a key thing to um, uh, to IntelliSense, um, and and we've kept that pioneering attitude um, to this day. Really, uh, I mean, it's it's not unusual for us to um, to, to enter a new a new uh, service before others see the opportunity there. And so when we did this in 2015, we actually put a business plan together and said, who are we going to be now? And we made up our mind that we were not just going to be a regional advisor, but we were going to try to expand our footprint. Um, And by expand, it was saying there's no reason we can't go national. And so we um, put together a plan to not only uh, have good organic growth, but to also uh, do inorganic acquisitions. Um, We also put in that plan, a business plan to get into private wealth. Okay. Now I can tell you, um, we failed three times before we finally um, got it right. Um, I mean, when we decided to get into private wealth, we knew we had all of these participants. At the time, it was 50-some thousand participants that we were the advisor on. And um, so they were going – we had warm leads into 50,000 participants. And we thought all we have to do – we've been communicating to them for years. um, We could take our same investment philosophy and apply it to individuals. And uh, even though that may have had merit, what we didn't understand was the service model of private wealth. It was just totally different. And we had no idea – on how we needed to put that together. And we also thought that this was just going to be an investment sale. And we were wrong there. This is a financial planning sale. And so, um, for example, when when we decided to get into this, um, I thought I could convert a 401k uh, advisor uh, to also take on uh, – private wealth clients. Um, I could do that, but we were unable to deliver um, A-plus service uh, on the private wealth side. So the advisors that were doing plans couldn't also, and and talking to the plan fiduciaries and the investment committees and such, couldn't also be the advisors taking on private wealth clients directly? Not and you know not and deliver an A paper on it, and we always say we want to always put out an A paper, and we were not putting out an, uh, an A paper uh, when we went that route. I mean, we collected we we collected some clients, but we we were not successful. And it wasn't until 2018 that we stumbled across the father son uh, duo that had a sustained uh, business based on financial planning, um, which we hadn't even thought of until uh, we found them. And um, we approached them uh, about being our solution. 
and uh, they turned us down. <laughs> They, they they turned us down, uh, and it was. You approached uh, them to be our to be the solution, meaning like you you we're, wanted we're gonna, to refer and partner with them, or like you wanted to acquire. No, them we wanted and, to acquire them. Okay, and and they would help us build this uh, this new business. And uh, the reason they said no is that this had, they were with a broker dealer that they'd been with for thirty some years, and the and the father. Um, which was the patriarch of the business, um, he had a lot of friends there. And mm-hmm. it just, you know, it didn't feel right to him. He wasn't ready. There was nothing inherently wrong. And he just, he, he was uncomfortable. And so we parted um, as friends. Now, the son delivered that message to me. And I'll never forget, the, the son said, Brad, um, I know that someday, the two of us are going to work together. That was his parting comment, you know, when he was giving me the bad news. And I, you know, I didn't really think of it at the time, but two years later, I, I called up and I, I said, uh, uh, his name is Matt. I said, Matt, I'm just calling, checking up, seeing how things are going. And he said, Brad, this is a timely call. I'm glad you called. We would like to sit down and talk to you. And two months later, the deal was done. Um, so what? So what had changed? I mean, 2018 to 2022 years later, like, is this COVID stuff is unfolding and and no. moods have shifted, or was other stuff under uh, um, in flux? What had changed for them is there was kind of new leadership at their broker dealer, and okay. all of a sudden the uh, the friends that they had there uh, either retired or just went in a different direction, and and they weren't happy about that, and oh. so um, that brought them back. Okay. Now they had a very fascinating business model, and this is the the reason why I, I really was attracted to them. They had um, they had their own. RIA. Well, actually, their the broker dealer was their RIA, but um, they had about um, twelve hundred accounts and about a million five in top line revenue. Okay. There were two advisors, father and son. They had three full time employees that were all licensed. But they had no sales responsibility. Their job was to basically be a relationship manager, to be able to process trades, uh, RMDs, uh, uh, just really, really help the producers in getting the stuff off their plate so that they could go out and find new clients and service the clients they, they got, they've got. Um, when we looked at their financials, remember they had a million and a half dollars of top line revenue and they had $300,000 of fixed expenses. So they had a million two of advisor comp. You know what the average account size was? $300,000, not $3 million, $300,000. And so you're looking at this and saying like, okay, these are. These are good economics, right? Like if you've got 1.5 million of fixed expenses, uh, heck, like if I if I pay these advisors three hundred thousand dollars each, it's still nine hundred thousand dollars of expenses. And I have a forty percent profit margin, right? Looking at this from the business owner, and like I got a forty percent margin on 1.5 million of revenue working with middle mass affluent middle market clients. Well, I thought about that, but really what I thought about more was I was thinking, that's the American worker. That's my 401k participant that everybody else says you can't afford to uh, work with them in private wealth. They had the secret sauce. They had the recipe for how to make a boatload of money um, on the American worker. So what was the... What was the distinction? I mean, just in your end, like what what were they doing different than – I'm sure you were looking at other firms as well who didn't have the same kind of compelling economics with the same average client. Like what what was this firm doing or had figured out that you weren't seeing elsewhere? Um, this is my impression and I didn't know it at the time. 
Um, but my impression was that the other firms that we were looking at um, had minimums um, of seven figures, generally at least a million dollars. These guys didn't look at it that way. These guys said, we can make money off a lot of money off the American worker. Remember, average account size of three hundred thousand uh, dollars with three licensed people. Basically, the metric was uh, another licensed person for every five hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue, and then we can make money off of those people and and um, take a financial planning approach to these people. Also, they were doing financial planning on every client uh, there. And and so, how does that differ for? Because just the the way you look at and think about the the economics of the business in the in the retirement plan advisor side, like it, it are these just like completely different alien numbers, or is this sort of similar, just different channel? How how do how do you how are you looking at these given what you lived for your whole career on the retirement plan advisor side? Well, we were concerned about uh, as I told you with the with the story about the client, uh, we were concerned about. Uh, the fate of the American worker, um, we had the feeling that we were getting the American worker to retirement, but then we weren't getting them through retirement. Mm-hmm. And yet we were, we had a lot of um, pressure uh, there because we were told that, that we wouldn't be able to afford to work with those people. And this proved that we could. This proved that we could hire young CFPs to uh, work their way up by working, you know, by, by doing all the day-to-day work on on um, these clients to free the senior C- CFPs um, to go out and service existing clients and attract new clients to join. And so it gave us. Um, from an economic standpoint, it was at that point that we started to think about, okay, how, I don't, it sounds so coarse to say, how are we going to monetize the American worker? Because we really weren't thinking ab- about it that way. Um, but I will tell you that um, oh, it had to be Thanksgiving of, oh, it was probably Thanksgiving of two thousand. 18 or 19. During that break, I asked my CFO to give me a whole bunch of data on um, on our clients. And, and that data included a number of participants and revenue. Um, and I, I took that break and I sat down and I figured out how much money um, we were making on each participant if we were the 401k advisor on the plan. Okay. And then I did the same thing for group insurance. And then I sat down and estimated what it would be coming from uh, private wealth if we um, were dealing with low account balances there. And at, what I found is that at least according to our data, internal data, that if we had all three of those things, we were, gonna, we were going to average um, about 3000 $200 per year on that client. Interesting. So that 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 becomes your potential basically like revenue per client uh revenue per plan participant opportunity. So how, how does that like can you break that down for me a little bit more of just like what what's the contribution is their retirement plan advisor what's their contribution doing employee benefits what's the contribution doing private wealth? It was $190 for 401k. It was right at $200 per participant for group insurance. And then remember, our average account balance was was $300,000 once this team joined us. Right. And um, I used 100 basis points on $300,000. So that'd be $3,000. So you add it up and it's yeah right about 3500 bucks. And for the first time, I sat at it and I looked at it and I said – Okay, this makes it pretty clear what I need to focus on here economically for the firm. Yeah, I had to get into private wealth and had I had to do it profitably, and I just stumbled upon uh, the the team that was going to get me there. Well, so it's a it's a it's an immense 
re- like revenue driver growth opportunity when just when I think about in that context, like you're going from a world where you know you 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 can you can generate four four hundred dollars ish per plan participant by providing them their four hundred one k services and group insurance and covering their group insurance needs and like oh by the way if you can do some financial planning advisory work for them it gives you like seven x the revenue. It does. <laughs> it's just. That's a really big multiplier. I just, I, I think, for almost any business, if you've got a relationship with a client that you're serving, and there's a thing you can also offer them that would be seven x the revenue, like it's pretty tempting to go there. That's a big well. I, I'll tell you what it what it uh, allowed us to do is yeah. is we said, okay, now how are we going to get access to all these participants in a meaningful way that the employer is going to be happy about? And um, we decided we were going to make financial planning an employee benefit. And and we've been successful doing that. You know, we looked at almost every 401k plan today has some fashion of financial wellness attached to it, generally by the record keeper. In fact, most record keepers have just beautiful parts of their website that deal with financial wellness. Uh, I mean, just beautiful. Um, but less than 10% of the people ever go out to that part of the website. <laughs> I, I mean, they just don't go out to it. And for the most part, um, from a competitive standpoint, all record keepers today have to have that component. But if you actually go and get the data, which I um, encourage every advisor working on 401ks, go get the data on how many people are actually hitting the landing page, how many participants are hitting the landing page for that financial wellness, and it will be under 10%. And well, then not you, just hitting the landing page, then then you got to get to like how many log in and do something in there. Well, I'm presuming that's just worse. I, I actually then said, then ask them how many w- uh, did one click in. Uh-huh. And it, it was, it was, it was 40% of, of the 5%. I mean, it was extremely uh-huh. low. And so even though that employer could check the box and say, I've got a financial wellness plan, you know, the engagement was next to nothing. Right. And so we knew that we needed to get in front of the participants and uh, we needed to teach them about financial planning. Um, and, and then COVID hit, quite frankly, and, and kind of pushed this even harder, uh, because all of a sudden COVID hit and all of a sudden it became really, really apparent to, uh, the employers that their employees were financially un- unhealthy, uh, dramatically. I mean, they didn't have a budget, um, had no idea what their net worth was, um, had never heard of uh, their, you know, the maximum loan or uh, debt load they should have. Never thought about having an emergency savings. Uh, the only death protection they had was the one times revenue that their employer paid for in their group life plan. Um, and they weren't on track for retirement. And I, and this was all happening at the same time. And we said, okay, we need to go out with a new message to our 401k participants. And that is, um, you cannot fix tomorrow's money, meaning the problems in your 401k. You cannot fix tomorrow's money problems when today's money is a mess. And so we went out and developed employee education pieces on those five things. Budgeting, debt load, emergency savings, life insurance protection, and retirement readiness. And we put separate um, group meetings together uh, there. We also created what we call a foundational financial plan. Um, and really, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give credit to um, eMoney. eMoney gave me this idea. I'm, e-money is who we chose for our financial planning software. I was sitting down and I was thinking, okay, how can I get something in the hands of these participants, every one of them, without asking them for any information? 
I'm going to get that information from the employer and the record keeper. I need, I need name. I need um, address since I'm, I'm going to, and I'll explain that later. I needed birth date. I needed wage and I needed account balance and deferral percentage. And with that, I could create a foundational financial plan that would give that person an idea of what a budget should look like. It would give him uh, an idea about what his ma maximum debt load should be. It would give him a range of what his emergency savings account would look like. Mm -hmm. It would give them a range of how much life insurance they should have. And it would give them uh, an idea where they needed to be today to be considered on track to have a successful retirement. So name... Well, just because you got to know who you're talking to, but like birth date, because that gives you their age, account balance and deferral percentage, so you can project a balance, wage, so you've got some sense of earning power, which gets you towards budget, debt load, emergency yep. account. Uh, and I think you said location, so I guess you can do- Well, I wanted to be able to, to, cost to of living. print it out. We wanted to be able to print out on one big piece of, of, of paper, which ended up being, you know, you fold it and, and you've got four pages there. And we printed that out and we first gave it to them at group meetings. But then we had clients saying, I, I want you to send this to the home. Uh, but our clients loved it. They just loved it, even though it wasn't actually perfect because we that's all the data that we had. But it was getting that employee to think and say, okay, I haven't done anything on this. Um, and it got them to, and, and the employer liked that a lot, especially dur during COVID. They were looking for things to help their people at that time. And um, uh, that just became a differentiator for us. I mean, we've, we've been able to get new 401k clients, clients because we give their participants that foundational financial so plan. So how are you developing this though? Because like this is these are not usually the kinds of inputs you can you know a automate into e money to create a one pager. Like are you we built adapting e money or you just started building your own? We built it. Input we built it. I mean, it, you know, we built it. It's, it's the spreadsheet technology, and um, we, we so you built just, you it. You built it yourselves in spreadsheets. Good old yep. good old Excel. Bless yep. Excel's heart. We do. Okay. Ah. Uh, so, so what you get like you get some kind of because you're on the plan. So I'm presuming like you can get some kind of export, right? For real, like CSV file or equivalent, you can get some kind of export from the record keepers and plan administrators to get the data because you're the advisor on the plan. So you have a you have access to the data. So you 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 get an export of the data from them, and then you can just kind of drop it into a spreadsheet template and start creating these one pagers for all the plan participants. Yes. Only with um, the record keepers will only release that if the client instructs them to do it, which they all do. I mean, I get data from Fidelity, which is probably the hardest ask. There, okay. we we can get that da data, and and our clients want us to have it because they want that they want that report to go out. And right. on the back page of the of the report will be a picture of an IntelliSense CFP that says if you want a comprehensive holistic financial plan, which would come for me money in our case, um, call Devin. Here here's your uh, advisor. So interesting. So um. So the idea here, I just want to make sure I understand the flow. So you go to the you go to the 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 client for you, which is the employer, and say we want to offer this sort of like financial education offering uh, uh, one pager for your employees. So if you'll sign this to grant permission for the information to be released, we'll download the information from uh, the record keeper uh, and the four hundred one k plan administrator. We'll generate these reports for your employees and we'll we'll make it available to them. We'll send it to them or we'll do a group education meeting or, or whatever it is. The employees then get the 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 one pagers or the little the packet. You get to do an educational moment then at the end of that or on the back of that report then says, and if you want to go even deeper, because let's all acknowledge this was kind of a, a first cut report with some general information, yep. but not super detailed. If you want to go deeper and figure out how this really applies to you individually, you know, an IntelliSense CFP is available to you. Just call Devin at this number and there's like Devin's smiling face at you and his phone number. Exactly. 
so do you charge the do you charge the firms for this like it has are you getting paid for any of this or or ultimately like this is a value add for the fur for the plan and it gets you in front of people because ultimately then they can become clients and you'll get paid further further down in the process we're charging and um, we've had success we have some employers that have paid a hundred percent of our cost um, some employers have paid uh, a part of it and and what's the What's the cost? Like, how do you price a service like it's, this? Because this is very different than traditional planning for how we we tend yeah, to charge it, like, it, for it, clients. Believe me, this has been um, this has been an ordeal for us because we had we knew what we charge from a retail standpoint. If somebody walks in an intelligence office and says, "I want a holistic, um, comprehensive financial plan," uh, how, how much is that going to cost? And our street price is twenty four hundred bucks. And so with that, I went to our clients. I tested this with my clients. And I said, um, because you're a 401k client of ours, we're going to cut that fee in half down to $1,200 per financial plan. And if we get your group insurance or if we have your group insurance, we'll take it down 50% again. And so we'll give a financial plan for $500 to $600 per participant if we had all those other businesses okay so and we were the only endorsed financial planner that they offer i didn't want to be on a list of area i wanted us to be the endorsed provider right because otherwise like you're you're getting them fired about financial planning to go pick someone else on the list like just that's that's not good economics at that point so so help me understand though this like the the pricing of the of the plan is that for doing the one pagers that you're creating, or that's like that's for the the, the plan plan if they will take that's action the off plan, the backs of the report? The comprehensive plan coming out of email. Okay. So what what about what about just the one pager part? Like, is that also a separate charge, or like that that you'll do just for marketing purposes? It, it, it is today. Purposes? In in the beginning, we just tested it for free. Okay. Um, and today, if we're going out, that that is um, that is a ten to twelve dollars per participant fee. Okay. So and that includes mailing it. We tested all of this, ironically, on some of our bigger clients because they tended to be the most courageous. I think. Interesting. So so you have some plan. You have some firms that might be paying. Two, three, as much as the full five hundred dollars per employee who wants to take advantage of it to get a to get a full on financial plan, uh, taking them through any money process that they have bought up to because they went through the kind of the initial one pager education and and said they wanted more. Correct. So, all right. So now I have like lot, lots of questions that are following on for me from this. So, uh, so what kind of I guess like conversion do you see i'm thinking of this in like marketing funnel terms but you know like if 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 a if a firm puts whatever it is you know 500 employees through the the initial like one pager financial education process how many of those 500 people are going to come on and do a plan with you like is it 1% of them is it 10% of them less or more the answer is it depends. It depends okay. on on uh, a couple of things. Um, the employer's got to back it. The employer's ha- has has got to go out and endorse not only us but the whole concept of financial planning and how important it is. And um, secondly, uh, they have to if they want us to do it all digitally in terms of communicating the plan to them, um, you're going to get less than five percent of the people initially to, to do much. Um, but if you put us in front of employees and do group meetings, and when I say group meetings, ideally they'll be mandatory on company time. And um, then um, you will increase that dramatically. And then if you can um, also do one-on-ones, your success will be a lot greater. I'll, I'll give you an, an actual um idea of what to expect. We, we were we were worried that we could outkick our coverage here. Um, and I, I have to give credit to Empower here. Empower is doing this. Uh, Empower is doing financial planning 
for employee benefits as an employee benefit, and they're doing it for that was part of why they bought personal capital was to like gear up the both the tech and the advisor depth to be able to do this. And they they're hiring tons of um, CFPs today. You know, they they have Lockheed Martin as a client that does this and they Lockheed Martin um they they paid for it by increasing their administration fee in the 401k by $15 um $15 per person per year so what they did is they effectively said if you pay an extra $15 per year for all I don't know 34 35,000 uh, participants will will give you a dedicated team of three experienced CFPs and they will provide uh, financial plans for anybody that won't win. anybody Be, it's anybody right cuz just at some point right it, it it it's it's essentially the uh the financial planning equivalent of the prepaid legal model, like well, a relatively small fee for every single person in your organization, and we'll give "quote unquote" un- unlimited access to the lawyers for whatever legal they need. They need because the reality is only a small percentage of people actually need it in any particular year. And so, as long as the plan is big enough, you know, law of large numbers takes hold, and you can actually predict utilization pretty pretty consistently and staff it accordingly. Um, exactly. Um, and so they, they, they made it seem to us like this was worth the risk here, especially if we were taking it out to clients that would give us a little grace if, if all of a sudden we got behind here. Um, but what we found, uh, I'm I'm talking about my biggest client was one of the people, was one of the firms that elected to do this 4,000 people. In small town, I mean, it's like Mayberry, Iowa, and um, and uh, town, you know, uh, population eleven thousand seven hundred people, and we introduced this, but we did it all digitally. They have not had us do group meetings yet. I think they're going to this next year. Um, we did it all digitally, and in the in the first two months, we had seventy people. Um, ask for a comprehensive financial plan. That's slowed down now, but it's still, you know, we, we've created, in essence, 70 um, yeah. disciples so, uh, of yeah, the process. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 70 new clients at once is, or in, in two months is not a, not, a, not a bad deal, to put it mildly. Oh, we were ecstatic. So, yeah. We were, I, I mean, so, we were ecstatic. So, so how, like, all right, so then a few follow questions. So, like, just uh, payments wise, how does this how does this work? Like, obviously, if if the employer is going to pay for it, they just you've already got payment mechanisms to do that because you're 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 doing the the plan consulting administration work anyways. If if the plan participants are doing it directly, like, just do they they cut you a check for up to six hundred dollars or whatever the number number is going to be based on what's been arranged and just you you've got this kind of high volume of uh of small checks as you take each plan participant because i'm assuming you can't or build a 401k the, plan for it directly or the well actually you can if it's offered to every participant it will if you were only offering it to the c-suite that would be discriminatory and you you couldn't make that a plan expense but if you offer it to every participant and the overall per participant fee is considered de minimis, which is generally under a hundred dollars. Um, then you can make that a, a plan expense. So, so the the one pager fee, the like ten to twelve dollars a head part, you can build the plan then because it it falls on that threshold. The I'm assuming though the like the the six hundred dollar financial plan fee that's too big to fall under the threshold. That's got to get paid outside. Correct. Okay, and you know we can we can um, we can get it from the participant, or we can uh, see if the employer uh, will do a payroll an after tax payroll deduction for it, which we have some employers doing that. We have a we have a significant uh, employer in eastern Minnesota. They've been a client of ours forever. We have all their benefits. Um, they were an early adopter of this. Um, let's see, they have 600 employees. They ended up paying 60% of, they, they treated it kind of like a match. 
you pay 40% of it, we'll pay, we'll pay 60% of it. And in that, we got the money, all the money from the employer because the employer not only paid us, um, but then uh, he payroll deducted it. It's kind of like a subscription type of yeah. situation. And um, uh, we're excited about it. So what does the overall model look like for you though, right? In the, in the wealth world, often at the end of the day, like we charge something upfront for the financial plan, but many firms, like the long-term revenue is still made on the advisory side. It's the, it's the investment management advisory side. Do you, do you have a similar path here where ultimately there's like, there's an advisory or other revenue opportunities after they pay their 600 to $2,400 for the plan as a one-time plan, or just that's the deal and then it's done and they can come engage again for a new plan for $600 in the future if they want to. Here's what ends up happening is, is we go through, we create the, uh, the comprehensive financial plan, which includes, um, uh, looking at their current investment portfolio and, and giving them recommendations there. And it's not uncommon for the participant to say, you know, I've been really happy working with you on the 401k. Can't you just take this too? Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and what we built from an investment side to do that is we built, um, we built a, a branded, Robo advisor, but we call it the bionic advisor, the, in, the intelligence bionic advisor, meaning uh, it's a piece of technology, but it always comes attached to uh, an intelligence advisor with it. And the technology we used was Charles Schwab's. Uh, they have what is called an intelligent portfolios. Yeah, they're, they're institutional intelligent portfolios offering. Okay. Yes, they give an advisor that software to be able to do that as an advisor for free if you have over a hundred million dollars custody and we have way more than that on the 401k side um and so they gave us that piece of technology and we use that as the primary um resource that we that we uh, would use for that. We had three different, um, we had, we had three different uh, investment approaches. We had what I call the low cost Vanguard approach where it's, um, it's all index funds um, at the lowest uh, cost possible. Then we have um, what I internally call the DFA approach, which is fundamental indexing. Um, and adding some alpha to uh, index funds. And all of those are in ETFs. And then we now have an actively managed um, strategy that is um, mutual funds, no transaction fee mutual funds. And that has worked wonderfully. It, it really has. And 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 so, what do you charge for that? Is that like a traditional one-ish percent advisory fee model? No, because the employer once again is endorsing us, we'll discount off of that. So Our how- normal fee for a person walking in the door would start at one twenty-five. Okay. For and that, then- if that employer is going to, you know, is going to be at, at around eighty basis points because it came to us through the employer. Okay. And so like what's the do you ha- do you have a sense yet of what's the the typical assets that you end out with in this in this model because I'm realizing like you're not getting the 401k side of them cuz what well, you have it but like you you have it on the retirement plan side so you you only end out with the other air quotes like the other assets beyond the 401k do you do you have a sense as to what that what that adds up to, what that ends up being. Well, what, what surprised us is, is um, if you look at at the annual revenue coming in, new revenue coming in for, from our wealth side of our practice, uh, 25% of that is coming off of 401k plans today. When we started this, it was 14%. We'd like it to get to over 50%, but it's just a function of, of integrating this approach into all, I mean, we have 300 and 
50 or 60 401k plans. So we, we have, we haven't introduced it everywhere. Um, I can tell you that we just did earlier this year, we did, uh, six case studies on clients that have adopted this. And we looked at it and we said, okay, let's look at all the revenue coming off of that client. What does it amount to? And, uh, we only looked at the, the 401k side. Um, and so we looked at that and in every one of those seven, our revenue had at least doubled with the introduction of wow. private wealth. And we had some of them that were up four to five X and that's in a fairly short period of time. And that's and most, that's either, that's planning fees and then some subset of clients that end out yes. saying like, will you just manage everything beyond my 401k? Yes. Yeah, and our our average account balance has gone up from three hundred thousand to four hundred thousand. But the vast majority has been out, not not rollovers. The vast majority has been non qualified money sitting at a broker somewhere. Right. So, what does the business look like overall today? You just you know, when you said like when you divested the record keeper, IntelliSense went from like one hundred and forty team members down to twenty. Uh, that was seven or eight years ago. So, like, wh- where is it today? What have you What have you grown back to? Uh, we're just over sixty today. Over sixty um, team members. Yes. Um, when we sold, uh, when when we sold the record keeper, we had three locations. It was Minneapolis, Albert Lee, Minnesota, which is a town of twenty thousand, about a hundred miles south of Minneapolis. Um, that's where our, our headquarters is, and then Kansas City. Uh, we have 12 offices today. Um, many of those have come, many of those, but not all have come through acquisitions. Um, and private wealth last year surpassed retirement for top line revenue. Wow. Okay. So the business is more than 50% private wealth now. Uh, well, no, it's it's forty eight percent private wealth. <laughs> then it's like forty percent um, uh, retirement, and then the balance is is group insurance. Okay, okay, because you're still doing the employee benefit side, group we health, are. group life, that all that stuff. And that may that makes it sound like our our group insurance has gone down. It it hasn't. It's just we've it's got just we've, we've, we've got over a billion dollars. Uh, uh, and private wealth AUM, um, and uh, if you look at the revenue, even though we've got five yeah. billion in four hundred one k advisory services, um, y- you know that that one billion dollars is producing more uh-huh. sales, and now yeah. it has more top line revenue. Yeah, our our, our yeah. cager on top line revenue since we got. Um, since we got into the private wealth business is like 22% per year since 2018. And our annual sales since 2018, our cager is 39%. In other words, our total sales per year today have gone up an average of of almost 40% since 2018, which just coincidentally is when we got when we got our act together in private wealth. Right. So what surprised you the most about this path of building advisory businesses? Um, the importance of financial planning. Hmm. I'll tell you, everything we do today in our firm, I mean, it has permeated retirement. Obviously, it's the major function in private wealth for us. Um, we actually call our private wealth business. We don't call it private wealth because the average American doesn't think they're wealthy. We, right. call, it, we, call, it, uh, we call it personal financial management. Um, but financial planning has permeated even the group insurance. I mean, we're including this type of service. In other words, we're, we're including uh, financial planning as an employee, as an employee benefit, not only to our 401k sales, but also to our group insurance sales. And I, I really think that even though somebody hasn't done it yet, but I really think that we may be asked just to do the financial planning as an employee benefit, and and we won't have any other benefits. I, I that wouldn't surprise me. It hasn't happened yet, but I think it will. So, what was the low point for you on this journey, on this growth uh, journey? <laughs> 
the failures, definitely the failures. I mean, you know, it was 2015 when we came came up with this. Uh, it, we we had the idea before. We just didn't have the bandwidth to do it until we got rid of the record keeper and. Um, those first couple failures, I mean, we were at a point where we were, we were going to say, we're not going to be in this business or we've got to commit to it. We committed to it. We failed three times, but we persevered. Um, but the failures. And the one, it was time. three, three years. I mean, it sounds like three years. Well, I guess even more than like three years of the failures and the struggles, but the acquisition of the father son duo that really powered it, like that came in. 2020 like you're four plus almost five years in they came in 2018 oh they okay they came in 2018 they came in 2018 and if you you know if you look at our financial history and the, the the impact was almost immediate it really was i mean granted they, they came with you know 1200 accounts and and um a million and a half do- dollars worth of revenue right um by the way, um, we 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 bought them, but they were so valuable that we actually bought them with stock, um, and they we we ended up effectively merging with them. We <laughs> used our stock to buy them because um, we couldn't lose them. Quite yeah. frankly, we had to keep them. Um, they were the secret sauce. They were the recipe, and it's just. I, I would say some of the other frustrations along the line are growth related. I mean, when you look at our growth path right now, um, I talked about technology um, uh, a little bit. Well, I, I yeah. brought up technology, but I, you know, um, we spent a lot of time on people and money on people. Um, but we spent uh, our tech spend today is close to seven hundred thousand dollars a year, and a good share of that is to service financial planning and personal financial management. So our tech spend is, is, you know, to do what we did is not, it's a heavy lift. And fortunately I had money. I had my winnings from selling the record keeping. And so I, you know, I will, I will say that it's not something that it takes a lot of time. It takes a really good people that you have to find. And then you've got to put the money in technology. Um, but you, you, you've got to have all of that in order for this to be successful. So what else do you, like, you know, now you wish you could go back and tell you, you know, 10, 20 plus years ago as you were building the business? <laughs> well, I, I would have been a little braver and taken a little time and got into wealth management a lot sooner. Let me tell you, <laughs> a lot sooner. In fact, I, I freely admit that to anybody who asks me that says, what's your do over? Mm-hmm. What's your mulligan? And I said, I wish I would have got into wealth management 20 years ago. I mean, I just think about it and I go, gosh, here I am kind of in the, the last quarter of my working career. And, and, uh, and I, I, I find this recipe that is going to do a number of things, not only financially for our firm, but, you know, I literally come to work every day energized by the thought that we're helping the 99% improve their financial well-being. I mean, that that is what we're all about here at IntelliSense. And it, it energizes me um, to say, here is our just cause. This is, this is what IntelliSense is all about, is helping those people. So our, our business plan is really for us to go out and find an area that we currently have no 401k plan penetration at all. St. Louis would be an example, if I'm just sticking to the mm-hmm. middle of the country. And uh, the first thing we would do if we wanted to get into St. Louis would be to find some uh, 401k advisor who was worried. They haven't sold yet to One Digital or Cap Trust or Sageview or Hub, uh, but they're nervous. Um, and they know they're going to have a hard time competing. Uh, with those people. And so they, we encourage them to come to us. They buy into the just cause and, and um, they're, they're probably smaller firms. You know, they'd have 
under a million dollars worth of top line revenue. I'd say they'd have somewhere between 400,000 and a million dollars worth of revenue would be the targets. Let's put, put it that way. And um, so we want to get them. And then after we give them our platform that we put together for helping their 401k business and growing that, then we'll say, okay, let's add a private wealth uh, component uh, on site with you in, in St. Louis. Instead of, I mean, we can service St. Louis from Kansas City or even Minnesota, right. but private wealth is kind of a personal business. <laughs> and and so we like to put a, a private wealth person right. with any place that we have a high number of 401k participants. So what advice would you give younger, like newer advisors coming into the business today? Get your CFP. That's, you know, if they if they just have their securities license, I, I would say get your CFP. You can you can do more things. And if there is any fee compression that eventually does come to, to private wealth, I, I think a way to keep your fees higher is financial planning. Yeah. So as we wrap up, this is a podcast about success. And just one of the themes that comes up is the word success means very different things to different people. And so you've had this incredible path, like building IntelliSense 240 team, then selling off about 80% of it, then like rebuilding and almost 3xing again over the past seven years. So you, you've had these incredibly successful paths of, uh, with the businesses. How do you define success for yourself at this point? Well, it's not, uh, you know, it's not wrapping this current business up, putting a bow on it and going out and selling it. I, I, um, I'm very, um, I feel really good about the sustainability of IntelliSense. If, if I were killed uh, tomorrow, uh, the company will go on. We have some tremendous talent um, that are in their 30s and 40s, and we happened upon those. Some of them came to us because they were attracted to our just cause, but some of them came with acquisitions. And, and like I had no idea, for example, that the son of the father-son um, savior of, uh, yeah. of our – private wealth business, um, I, I had no idea he had the leadership qualities he had, especially for a 35-year-old. Um, I mean, just tremendous um, uh, qualities that I know that he would be a key component in keeping this business together if something should happen to me. And so su success for you is the creating the talent opportunities, bringing the talent onto the team? And having a sustainable business that can survive me. Um, you know, we have no, we have no design to sell this, up, wrap this up, put a bow on it and sell it. That's, that's not, we have this just cause <laughs> and that, that kind of sets the tone for, uh, IntelliSense about fixing what was broken in the private wealth business. The private wealth business, in our opinion, was broken when it came to the American worker. I went to a fidelity conference once and they called the, the, the 99%, they called them the underserved. They, they, they had no desire or intent to go and solve that problem. They, in fact, they just said, you can't make any money there. You can make money there. We, we've proven it that you can make money there. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we have created a profitable business and we've solved an issue. And that is the poor, or we haven't solved it yet, but we have a recipe that we believe will solve the problem of the poor financial health of the American work. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you so much, Brad, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. It's, it's been my pleasure. It really has. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.